Thank you. In my practice, I'm going to say 80%. So if people just follow just general recommendations, even what, what Jyoti is talking about, even what Ray is talking about, usually we'll see a huge change. And so it is more than what I, I agree with her. It's more than what they think. Because most of these people have been taking drugs for their blood sugar, their cholesterol, or you know, and, and all these other things. And literally by the lifestyle changes, they will see significant. Sometimes what we see is many times more benefits without the side side effects. We call it side benefits rather than side effects. However, this is, it's not 100%. It's not even 90%. It's 80% what we see. And then in everybody, it's kind of like this general epigenetic will change about 80% inf improvement in form and function. Why is it not 20%? Because that's why we have to start digging deeper, right? Because that's the whole individualistic aspect of your nutrition, your microbiome, you know, how is everything working, your stress, your environment, what chemicals or not chemicals you're exposing to or whatever, your sleep, your social, your social environment. So that's where then we have to fine tune it. That, that the problem is, that's the bigger challenge because most people can do the, the simple things or what we would consider, I think, simple. But it's a harder thing because like if you live in a city that's really loud and noisy and there's a dry cleaner below you, that's a problem, right? There's, you know, or, or vice versa, right? If you, don't, if you live in a food desert, you don't have access to some of the things that you know is healthy. So that's the challenge I think that we will see with a lot of patients is economics, you know, access. Some of these things that are, again, a little bit out of their control, but we still know that we can still improve it. So it's not like just a lot of people want to have the perfect I think that's the problem with America right now. It's like we want to have the perfect plan and we want to have everything ready to make the recipe, for example. And if we don't, we won't make it. And we have to be more loose and open saying, you know what? We can still make the food. It's just missing a spice or two. It still be fantastic. Don't worry about it. And that's, that's the kind of part of, of being a chef in the, in, the, in the medicine world is that you know how to really play with everything rather than being a cook and just trying to follow a recipe. And I think a lot of people are trying to follow recipes so perfectly and then they're hard on themselves, it triggers more inflammation, triggers more stress. I like to be like, people have to be really flexible because sometimes we can excel in one area very well and then have trouble. So some people may be able to exercise really well and know, know nothing about what to do in the kitchen, right? So I think we have to also uh, educate our clients or point them in directions on how to improve those lifestyle factors so that they get a little bit of everything, even if it's not coming firsthand to them. And one more thing I wanted to say was one of the hidden pieces of things, you know, in information that I personally have learned over 30 years is that trauma in people's lives really hold back healing. And so that is a huge out of control segment. So for those people that I'm like, huh, why isn't the needle moving? You know, whether they're you know, living on a in this environment that's polluted or having a toxic relationship at home or a work relationship that I don't know about um, or something of that nature. I've found that trauma, especially in childhood or in the first two decades of their life, can actually really impair healing and the rate of healing as an adult. Thank you. Um, aside from diet, sleep and exercise and avoiding chemicals. Uh, do you want to give your thoughts on nutritional supplements, vitamins and minerals? Is there um, basic foundational ones that you think we should all be taking? Should we be avoiding them? Do, what is your, I know you can't give us a personal recommendation because you don't know us and our blood and all that, but if you had to do a general uh, assessment of what people in general need, what would, how would you advise us on that topic? You want to go? Um, I always start with, you know, we do testing. We test for nutrients in our office. We test gut, gut microbiome. So a lot of our, our testing, our supplement recommendations are based on tests. But in general, one of the things that I see over and over, over again is magnesium deficiency and magnesium is a huge nutrient that does 300 things in our body. Um, I think getting magnesium through uh, green leafy vegetables and, and fruits and nuts and seeds and avocados is wonderful, but sometimes people need more help because it does things like help us sleep. It helps with constipation, helps with anxiety, it helps with um, headaches and muscle tension. So Magnesium is one thing that I talk about a lot with my patients, and we do talk about prebiotics to help the growth of the microbiome as opposed to probiotics, which are, you know, something that can only give you the fixed amount of of, um, of organisms in a in you know in each capsule. So, food that grows the gut microbiome, nutrients, nutrients, and especially in the plant based world, 
B12, zinc, vitamin D uh, are some key players that over and over again, I've needed to supplement because we can't sometimes get it enough through our diet. Thank you. You okay, know what? I'll go. <laughs> so I wasn't sure. I was, like, I was giving Ray. Um, so yeah, I agree. I, I agree. Like there's certain things that you'll see that are common that are that are deficiencies, and and so we also test, and so that's a good thing. And, and we try to push the food that those nutrients are healthily found in first, because food is medicine in our practice. As you can see with all the spices here, and then we like to look at targeted aspects of things that you know, because I'm trying to avoid redundancy. And I think the challenge that I think we all see as providers is that people are taking the same thing over and over again, that may not be something that's truly deficient or truly needed. And that's where testing is, I like, and I think Joy, Jyothi would agree, it's like, it really helps guide us and also helps guide the patient because usually they come in and, you know, they might be on eight to 10 pharmaceutical drugs in America, that's the average person I see. And then, then they'll be on like eight to 15 supplements, right, from all the healthcare providers and health stores and online and whatnot. And so, the, but they're still not feeling good. So we really want to look at like what is targeted for them. And so my specialty uh, in integrative medicine is formulation of product and looking at, again, evidence-based in terms of putting nutraceuticals together. And that's where I try to look at like, what can we get from food and really push it from food? And then things like she was talking about, what Jesse's talking about, like, yeah, someone's going to come out with the magnesium deficiency, say 800 milligrams deficient, then it's going to be harder to get that from a source of food, especially in the time frame that we're looking to get the patient having improvement of symptoms and therefore a supplement would be important. But the key is what most people are concerned about supplements is quality, potency, purity, safety, and efficacy. And that's one thing that you, with having a practitioner who's either um, educated in that or is able to provide guidance on where to get or how to read a label or what to look for manufacturing, then that's when we kind of can help take it to the next level. I think doctors who don't play around with supplements have the right to say, don't take anything because it's true. If you go to the store every day, there's a study showing that most of these supplements are uh, don't have what the label contains or may have adulterants or actually may be harmful. But then there's a huge uh, data set if you get the right product, the right potency, purity, safety, and efficacy, you can have wonderful benefits of taking supplements. But I think it's always making sure that it's targeted. So we're not just being redundant and taking something that we don't need. We need it to be taking something that we might need or we might need more of. And that creates a physical uh, effect in the body. And, and that makes people will say, I feel better from taking it rather than I just, I take all these things, but I'm not sure what's working. Thank you. I defer to my colleagues. I learned from them. <laughs> um. So, Ray, you wrote a book about Parkinson's, a really um, difficult health challenge that a hundred, you know, virtually not virtually, a hundred percent of people would do anything to avoid. Um, and there's not a lot of books on Parkinson. Maybe in the research areas there are, but to the public, I don't see too many. When I look for speakers for the conference, it's hard to find someone who wrote a book on Parkinson's. So, in my mind, you're a hero. Um, are you a hero or not in your area? Is everyone embracing you? Is everyone saying this information is fantastic? Let's spread it to uh, med schools. Let's tell everyone. Let's stop dry cleaning. What What has been the response to your work? So let me name some heroes. So Michael J. Fox, there's a hero. For 30 years, not only has he bared the burden of Parkinson's disease, which he thinks, which he said publicly, he thinks is due to some kind of environmental toxin but he's been the face of a disease. It's really hard to have Parkinson's disease or any disease. It's really hard to beat that and have be the face of it. His foundation, because of him, has raised $2 billion uh, over the last 20 years. I think we as a community are failing Michael J. Fox. You know, we have not uh, addressed it. Um, a second hero is Dr. Caroline Tanner. Uh, she's the heroine of our book. She's a Parkinson's specialist and epidemiologist at, at U University of California, San Francisco. For the past 40 years, she's been telling us that environmental toxins, including paraquat, including trichloroethylene, including perchloroethylene, including air pollution, are fueling the rise of, of Parkinson's disease, and we haven't listened to her. Um, I think we're stuck in the wrong paradigm. Uh, we're we are all we're trained in a biomedical uh, view, a lens of uh, of health whereby diseases are either a function of aging or a function of genetics. And let me be clear that Parkinson's disease is not a natural consequence of aging. Parkinson's disease is not a natural consequence of aging. You put mice in the laboratory and you let them live a nice long life, they don't spontaneously develop Parkinson's disease, nor they spontaneously, to my knowledge, develop Alzheimer's disease. These are pro products of our environment. And when you're trying to push a new idea, you encounter resistance. 
The resistance is among your peers and those who are senior to you because they grew up in this paradigm. Uh, the newer generation, you tell the newer generation, anyone under 30, that environmental toxicants are causing disease. And they go, of course, what, <laughs> tell me something I don't know. Um, so uh, I think there's resistance and there's industry resistance. You know, I've had uh, law firms sending uh, people to issue subpoena me at, at my front door and having my 18 year old son have to answer the door. We should find that completely and morally unacceptable. We should hold wrongdoers accountable. We should name these law firms. We should name the chemical companies that are doing it. We as a community of physicians and scientists and health advocates should find this incredibly uh, uh, unacceptable. We're finding pesticides in Cheerios, according to the Environmental Working Group. If Cheerios has pesticides in it, then what other foods have pesticides and other chemicals into it? And why is our health getting worse? Why is cancer rates increasing under people under the age of 50 in the United States at the same time smoking is decreasing? Why is life expectancy less even at, even ignoring COVID today than it was 25 years ago and we're spending more on healthcare? Why are we spending 20% of GDP, $4 trillion on healthcare to get five years less life expectancy than our peers in France? Clearly we're doing something wrong. Clearly someone is doing something bad to us we need to find out who those wrongdoers are and find them and hold them accountable. Amen, brother. <laughs> I completely agree with that. Yes, I completely you. agree with that. The, the challenges, I think, is is exactly the same. It's like, you know, they're, they're, we're taught about a disease model and and environmental uh, exposures and toxins is not is you know wasn't in that training but that's becoming more and more of an issue i think with michael j fox what they found uh, if I, you probably know more than that but it's like you know when he just, when we had that start of early symptoms of parkinson's there was a cluster on the set when they followed on one of the back to back to the future films i forget which one of people that had parkinson's right so that kind of led like wow it's not just one person but it was a few people and a few people at one time you know so there's definitely like the odds of just a genetic, no, odds of this, no, but it has to be some kind of, you know, exposures has to be some, you know, related to something. I don't know if we have that full answer, but these are certain things that we now seeing, you know, with, when we see this explosion and literally, I think the, the problem right now with the aging population, which is sinking our healthcare costs with neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and dementias and Alzheimer's and, and just, just and there's memory care units everywhere I see around my city. Um, is that, you know, it, it's, a, it's such a debilitating condition because when you can't remember or you can't function correctly, then the cost of that healthcare, even though the rest of the person might have pretty, pretty healthy body, um, it's super expensive. And that's going to bankrupt the country. It's going to bankrupt the, the whole system. And that's what the data actually shows what's going to ha happen is these neurocognitive disorders is going to sink the, the whole economy because there is not a quick fix because it's multifactorial. I think a lot of these chemicals he's talking about, absolutely. And there's probably a hundred more that we don't even know. And there's even synergies with not only like we talked about synergy of nutrients for improving your function, right? Like adding more spice or adding more phytonutrients to your diet. But what about the synergy of chemicals? How certain chemicals can enhance further chemicals? Because we only study even one thing as toxic. What about 10 of them together? How is there a super toxic? And there probably is, right? There are certain things that probably enhance absorption or crossing blood brain barrier, or other things like that. So there is an issue, and those people and those companies should be held accountable. The problem is since schools and funding are educated related to corporations in this there's a little bit of like nobody like uh, nobody wants to have a letter like he's getting sent to their you know because we don't have the defense fund to defend that but i appreciate when people come out and speak because it's through the the awareness and education and i think it's through the people at the end of the day people have more power than they they, they think is that we can take on a corporation and it can happen there can be class action lawsuits it's just more people have to be participated i think on the paraquat um that was actually turned down the other day i think if, if you're following the the news so we know all the dangers of it. There's so much influence in industries. Like they don't want an industry that makes billions of dollars. So they will rather have that go on than, than save it for, for public safety. So it is an issue. And I, and I, I really appreciate everything that Ray had to say. Thank you. Just a couple of notes on Dr. Pai. He's well-versed. Uh, so Michael J. Fox was part of a cluster. This has been public reported in the New York Times and in the neurology literature. Uh, three other people on, uh, the, he was working on a, sitcom called Leo me Leo and me before he did family ties that yeah. they were all working in underground studio at uh, three at least three other individuals all had relatively early onset uh Parkinson's disease. again he said to Jane Polly that he thinks he got Parkinson's from exposure to some kind of toxin and then Paraquat 
is a weed killer. It kills the weeds that Roundup doesn't. It's been used to commit homicide and suicide. The EPA's own website says one sip can kill. Over 30 countries, including China, have banned it. The United States has not. It reauthorized its use. Um, uh, it's being sprayed on fields uh, on corn, cotton, uh, soybean, and vineyards, including in upstate New York, 20, 30 minutes from where I'm sitting uh, right now. It's associated with a 150% increased risk of Parkinson's disease.